right. So I am going to go ahead and get us started. We have uh, people who are joining, uh, but uh, we've got a big agenda today, a lot of great, great speakers. And so we wanna get moving on this. Uh, as I said before, my name is Ryan Owens. I am the director of the Tommy Thompson Center on Public Leadership. Uh, I am happy to have you with us. I'm happy to have everybody here with us. Uh, before we begin, just a couple of, of thoughts uh, from my end. Uh, first, I want to thank, of course, you all for listening and paying attention here. I'd like to also thank our staff at the Thompson Center, uh, both Eric Templis, the assistant director, and Tia Westhoff, the administrative assistant here, do fantastic work at the Thompson Center. Um, they, they really get this thing running. We couldn't do what we do without them. So I wanna give them all of my thanks. Uh, thanks, of course, go to all of the folks here who are on this, um, our moderator, our speakers, great people who are going to give us some really, really excellent information. So thank you to you all as well. Now, before we move forward, just a, a quick thought from my perspective here at the Thompson Center. Um, there will be a, a great discussion here about free speech and what it means today in contemporary politics and contemporary law. It's important that we have this dialogue because we know that dialogue is the best way forward uh, for better policies and a better community. There will be some positions here that some people agree with or that some disagree with. There will be some with which I agree and some with which I disagree. And that's fine uh, because that's the point. The point is for us to have the dialogue because this is such an important topic. So having said that, uh, I want to turn very briefly um, to the event itself. There will be a Q&A feature here that our moderator will talk about um, uh, where you can ask questions. But for those of you who are attorneys, just want you to know that this event has been approved for two CLE credits. You can check the chat feature here to see how you can obtain those credits. So uh, we are very, very pleased to have with us today uh, Dean Daniel Takaji from the UW Law School. Uh, Dean Takaji has been a professor at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law since 2003, uh, serving as associate dean for faculty since 2018. He is, of course, now a very proud Badger, and we're proud to have him. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard College and Yale Law School. He clerked for the Honorable Stephen Reinhardt of the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Uh, before he was a uh, an academic. He was a civil rights lawyer in California for a number of years, and his area of research expertise is on the First Amendment. So he is absolutely uh, a stellar scholar and a wonderful person to have moderating this panel. We thank you for being here. I am going to turn it over to you right now, Dean Takaji. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Ryan. I want to begin by thanking the Tommy Thompson Center on Public Leadership for bringing us all together today. Thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us for what I hope and expect will be a fantastic event. Thanks most of all to the distinguished group of panelists that the Thompson Center has invited and who have agreed to participate today. Um, I uh, very much look forward to a robust discussion of our topic for the day, the First Amendment on college campuses. Uh, just a, a brief uh, word about format and how you can participate. Um, we're going to have five panelists today who I will introduce immediately before they speak, uh, but just so you know who they are, um, they, they will present in the following order. First, Greg Lukianoff. Second, Carlos Cortez. Third, Suzanne Nossel. Fourth, Robert Mark Simpson. And fifth, Christina Olstadt. Uh, each of them will present for approximately 12, view, 12 minutes on the topic. Um, we will then open it up for questions. I'll start by posing some questions to the panel and then turn to questions you have. Now, if you want to pose a question, you can actually do so at any time during this panel by going to the Q&A uh, tab uh, or box at the bottom of your screen. On mine, it appears at the bottom on Zoom Q&A. That will allow you to submit a question 
And uh, we may not be able to get to all of the questions you ask. I hope there will be a lot, um, but we'll get to as many of those as we reasonably can. Um, you can direct any questions you care to ask through the Q&A box to individual panelists or to the panel as a whole. Um, so again, each of the speakers will present for 12 minutes and we'll then go to questions and answers. I know there are some attorneys who are on here for CLE credit and at appropriate points in the proceedings, we will have a CLE pause, which I think most of those of you who are attorneys are used to, to provide the information that you'll need to get CLE credit for this event. We're going to start with Greg Lukyanov. He is the president of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. He's also the author of Unlearning Liberty, Campus Censorship and the End of American Debate, Freedom from Speech and the Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. He's also the author of FIRE's Guide to Free Speech on, on Campus. Greg, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really honored to be a part of this great group. Uh, and since I have 12 minutes to cover the history of free speech, I'm gonna have to move pretty fast. Um, so I, I call freedom of speech the eternally radical idea, not because it's um, something that people strive for in every generation, but because it's things that human beings have a tendency to crush in every <laughs> generation. Uh, and let's, let, let's, take a, let, let's zoom out in, in, into all of history. How do human beings typically treat dissenters? Well, we make them take hemlock, we burn them at the stake like Giordano Bruno in 1600, uh, we crucify them uh, as the Romans did to people who opposed, the, opposed their state. We're not good at it. There, there's a great book that talks about in our evolutionary history, uh, when you, you only tended to meet people you disagreed with at the, at the end point of a spear. Um, and outside of the U.S., you can still you can see uh, some of this. Um, what, what, what repression looks like? You know, people being arrested for blasphemy. Uh, you know, a, a crime that um, the, the First Amendment does not allow for. You got Glenn Greenwald getting in trouble in Brazil. You've got uh, the, the noble uh, doctor getting in trouble in China for reporting on COVID and then shortly uh, dying shortly thereafter. And in, in my father's uh, country in Russia, it's just horrifying. Um, you know, uh, 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 dissenters are, sh are killed. And there's currently one being uh, uh, Alexei Navalny currently in prison. So I get uh, sometimes frustrated that people will present the American uh, Revolution as if it was, um, it's sometimes called this because it was less radical than, than the French Revolution. Um, and I don't actually agree. I think we've got that exactly backwards. Um, the French Revolution was all about sort of communitarianism and, and uh, Rousseauian idea of, of getting back to the land. The radical revolution, in my opinion, was the rights revolution um, that was embodied in the Bill of Rights and, and, and the U.S. Constitution. Um, and that's what I call the eternally radical idea. Because you look at this one sentence um, in the, uh, the, the First Amendment, it is trying to say we will no longer uh, shed blood over religion, over opinion, over press, over uh, freedom, uh, freedom of association. We will never impose religion on you. And it seems humble to us now, but it was a, the idea was to, in one single sentence, to just eliminate the things Europeans had been murdering each other by, by, the, by the millions, literally, uh, for, for, for the previous uh, several centuries. It's an incredibly ambitious idea. And this is, uh, and the beauty of this, and, and one of the things that attracted my, you know, my father, my family to come to this country um, is, is not lost on, you know, first generation kids like me. And meanwhile, I work on college campuses. I went to law school specifically to be a First Amendment lawyer. Um, and this is what I've been able to do with my career. But I see this misconception popping up among students today that freedom of speech is the argument of the bully, the bigot, and the robber baron. What's remarkable here is, of course, robber barons, um, rich people, powerful people, uh, don't really need freedom of speech historically because they're rich and powerful. Um, it's no mistake that kings literally went to the merchant class to ask for money and then gave them some say in government. It's a part of the way we got some self-representation. And when it comes to uh, bigoted or bullied ideas, if you have 50% of the vote and it, once you get to, to democracy, um, you can kind of do whatever you want. So freedom of speech is an argument that is only needed for minority opinions. This is something that I feel like is not taught to students today. This is why Ida B. Wells um, you know, called her newspaper that tried to reveal 
the level of lynching that was going on in the American South in the early part of the century. Uh, she called her, her paper free speech. This is why John Lewis uh, talked about without freedom of speech, the civil rights movement would have been a bird without wings. Nelson Mandela uh, was, was famous for supporting, Gandhi wrote about the importance of freedom of the press. And someone you might not have heard of, Frank Kameny, one of the great uh, pioneers of the gay rights movement, credited not just his own free speech, not, not uh, but the, the fact that you could hear what bigots actually sounded like was helpful to their cause because they could show how pitiable um, the people who opposed them were. So what's going on on campus? A campus, frankly, the, uh, the power dynamic is reversed to a degree and it doesn't, and campuses really can't own its own power and privilege to a degree. It's an incredibly wealthy institutions. Um, it's more influential than, than uh, founders ever dreamed it would be. Uh, fancy schools like Princeton and Yale and Stanford get to decide more or less who's gonna run our country. And once you're in power, it's very easy to see freedom of speech as a problem to be dealt with rather than the, the solution for minority points of view. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, more granularly about my experience on campus. Again, I went to law school specifically to do First Amendment work, to do free speech work. I worked at the ACLU of Northern California. I, I saw a ridiculous number of cases. Um, and nonetheless, I was not prepared, even back in 2001, at how easy it is to get in trouble for what you say on campus, um, even back in 2001. And one thing I really want to stress is that there's this sort of primitive idea, and people don't really look into what's actually going on on campus. And they think it's like, oh, well, this is just to ban hate speech or sexist speech. Um, I have to say that I, at this point, we get about 1,500 case submissions a, a year at FIRE. Um, and how often it is actually the minority students who are getting in trouble, the poor students who are getting in trouble, the first generation students who are getting in trouble. And this is absolutely predictable to those of us who support free speech, that this would be the case. I mean, I had a case where a, um, a, an African-American student wanted to bring a someone who was fired from the National Review for writing a, a bigoted article. He wanted to bring him to Williams in order to debate him. Um, I thought this for, for, by the way, for a program called Uncomfortable Conversations, this would have been amazing. The, the student was named Zach Woods. He would have sent this person into a full backpedal if he'd been allowed uh, to debate him. But he was stopped by the uh, university president who didn't want, uh, didn't want that debate to take place, didn't want that person to set foot on, on, on a, uh, at Williams. And I see cases like this all the time. We're currently dealing with, a, uh, that we have a situation uh, with another African-American plaintiff that we're suing on behalf, who's being told that she can't maintain her Instagram feed and her Twitter feed because she's at pharmacy school. Um, and this is the thing that I really wish people would, would look at what the cases really look like on the ground because they don't look the way you expect them to. Um, if that is if you think that you know, enlightened censorship can really work. Uh, one thing that you might not know about are things, are the things that come out of the fact that universities are very administrator driven. Um, the uh, free speech zones, for example, which we've defeated all over the country, are bans on people uh, on people uh, congregating outside of uh, small areas. So, for example, we had we fought a free speech gazebo at Texas Tech University, in uh, 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 and they, it was twenty feet wide for all twenty eight thousand students on that campus. 20, 20, feet of, 20 feet of freedom for 28,000 students. We worked it out that if God forbid all students wanted to exercise their free speech at the same time, you would have to crush them down to the density of uranium-238. And that, then that, there, that's no joke. Um, although, you know, funny, uh, uh, no, no joke nonetheless. Sorry, my, my timer is sh shutting off. Um, and what I've seen, you know, for examples of speech codes, uh, you know, a, a, what do they include? Well, one of my favorites was, of course, the ban on inappropriately directed laughter, um, which was applied at uh, both University of Connecticut and Drexel. Uh, this is a policy that makes it possible for administrators to punish virtually anybody. And that's the thing that I, that I, I try to get through to students is how often I see these codes that uh, to a degree, sort of who cares that they're initially passed with some amount of, of, um, of good intentions. Censorship always thinks it's doing the right thing. That's situation normal for history. But who do they get used against? They get used against, you know, students that, that uh, administrators don't like, uh, students who make the school look bad. Um, how many cases I've seen where it's actually a student getting in trouble for complaining about parking at a school? Um, it, like, again, again, it doesn't look like you think it's going to look. 
Uh, there is good news. We've been successful in decreasing the number of uh, speech codes on campus. Originally, there about 75% of universities had speech codes. Uh, we've gotten it down to uh, red light speech codes. We've got that number down significantly. Uh, the number of schools that actually uh, got rid of their speech codes, that's been increasing. But the most troublesome thing in my experience, in, in my career, frankly, uh, the thing that led me to write Coddling the American Mind, both the article and the book, was that for my entire career, the students had been the best constituency for free speech on campus, period. They understood that comedians would sometimes be offensive. They understood that their, uh, the, the, their professors uh, might want to teach uh, edgy, difficult topics. They were on our side for my entire career up until 2013. Um, and there was a very dramatic shift in 2013. Um, there was a new cohort of students who saw free speech as part of the problem, not, not the solution. Uh, and it was kind of heartbreaking to me, uh, to, to be honest, to watch this take place. Um, students were demanding new speech codes. Students were demanding uh, uh, speakers be disinvited. Um, and what was strange to me was they were often grounding these rationalizations in medicalized language. Uh, the theory, and I, I could explain it in greater detail uh, uh, later if I get the opportunity, uh, was essentially that not only were we teaching a generation of students the habits of censors and, and people uh, unused to living in, a, in a, a free society, we were teaching them the habits of anxious and depressed people, um, uh, cognitive distortions they're called. Uh, so we predicted in 2015 that we'd see a, a decline in mental health among young people if they maintained uh, these ideas. And it was unfortunately a horrifyingly bad decrease in, in mental health, which is, the, which is one of the things we look into coddling the American mind. Unfortunately, it's only gotten worse. In, 20, uh, in, the, in the last year, on a very busy year, we get about a thousand case submissions, students and professors asking for help. This past year, we got 1,500, even though most campuses were closed. Um, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, and and to, uh, to close, I will just mention um, the one of the saddest things that's happened in my career was I had a friend named Mike Adams. Um, he was a bombastic conservative, no doubt. Uh, he would, uh, he, that was his style. He thought he was trying to be Lenny Bruce style, kind of in your face and something that was, if not liked, acceptable until maybe about seven years ago. Um, and during the summer when he uh, put a, sent a slightly off color tweet, actually relatively tame for him, uh, it led to him being uh, kicked off campus to having to retire early at, at the age of 55. Um, I checked in with him in mid-July about how he was doing, and he, he was not doing well. Uh, but what I never expected was that he killed himself the next week. Um, and it's important to understand that although there, that the, 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 the idea that going after people who say horrible things might feel, you know, righteous. Um, it has a real human cost uh, that, that needs to be appreciated. And I do think that ultimately the same people who r rely on free speech uh, are, and benefit the most from free speech should be defending it. Uh, and I hope to persuade more people that free speech is a value worth fighting for. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Carlos Cortez. He is Professor Emeritus of History at the University of California, Riverside, and a former fellow of the University of California National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement. He is also the author of Free Speech, Fostering Civic Engagement at the Intersection of Diversity and Expression. Professor Cortez. Please unmute yourself. Three years ago, I became an inaugural fellow of the University of California National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement. As a retired history professor turned diversity consultant, I have proposed this question. Why have so many diversity advocates become vigorous opponents of the hallowed American tradition of free speech? I began by examining where free speech defenders stood in relationship to diversity. They tend to fall into two categories. The first category champions free speech while relegating diversity concerns to secondary status. They cite Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis 1927 Whitney v. California opinion. If there be time to expose through discussion the falsehood and fallacies to avert the evil by the process of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. But time marches on. The instantaneous nature of the internet has obliterated Brandeis, if there be time, safety net. 
and has undermined the leisurely strategy of more speech. The second group of free speech defenders takes diversity concerns more seriously. Some even try to make the impossible argument that diversity and free speech are compatible, but to no avail. Diversity and free speech are simply not compatible. Diversity imperatives coexist with the First Amendment and can coexist with robust speech, but not with free speech because remaking the speech environment, including restraining speech, has become one fundamental goal of the diversity movement. In fact, as Greg just pointed out, the emphasis on speech restraint has grown exponentially over the past decade, unfortunately, sometimes infused with authoritarianism. As one who lived for nearly two years under a military dictatorship, I cherish the constitutional protections provided by the First Amendment, protections against government interference with speech. But the Constitution does not guarantee walk around free speech for the individual. Most diversity advocates focus not on constitutional issues, but on walk around speech, including restraining that speech. But how? So I switched lenses, stepping away from the legal framework and instead focusing on historical lived speech experience. Now things became much clearer. In the world of daily living, walk around speech is definitely not free. People can utter words, but they must also face the consequences, which in turn constrains future speech. Ordinary folks hear the words free speech and incorrectly think they actually have it. They speak or write. And when they get sued or fired or have an application rejected because of something they said, they often complain, but what about my free speech? All I can answer is, dude, you don't have it. Let me be clear. I am not against free speech. It simply doesn't exist as a lived reality. Take higher education. College applicants whose admissions have been revoked for something they posted online. Professors who have been removed from classes for saying the N-word. Administrators have lost their positions because of statements made years earlier all free to utter words, all subject to consequences. For my new book, I create a portrait of our nation's elaborate, informal system of speech restraints. Then I add diversity, which has played three roles in restraining speech. First, it's become part of America's long extant speech tradition. Uh, second, it continuously adds new concepts from which speech restraints emanate. Microaggressions, dead naming, me too, race lighting, implicit bias, cultural competence, misgendering. But the most fascinating phenomenon has been the meteoric rise of diversity as a fundamental national value. And when I say diversity, I also include its growing list of linguistic companions, inclusion, equity, social justice, anti-racism. In the short span of a half a century, Diversity has risen from being an inert dictionary term into becoming a formidable challenge to the previously hegemonic value of free speech. But how did that happen? I'm not exactly sure. Thousands of books have been written about diversity itself or about various diverse groups. But I have not found a single convincing historical analysis of the half century rise of the diversity movement and its challenge to free expression. In my nearly completed book on diversity in speech, I try to provide such a historical explanation. One complication is that the diversity movement is no monolith. Rather, it is an enormous, fractious, ever-changing set of individuals, groups, and organizations. Now, some critics falsely portray it as monolithic, political correctness, cancel culture. But when it comes to speech, diversity supporters do not present a common front. In fact, I identified four major strands of the diversity movement, each with its own approach to remaking the speech environment. First, the intercultural strand, drawing heavily from the field of intercultural communication. Now, interculturalists focus on convincing people to become more responsive to otherness by voluntarily adapting their communication patterns. Growing up in Kansas City, Missouri in the 1940s, we referred to such voluntary speech self-restraint as 
common courtesy. Second comes the equity and inclusion strand, which developed out of the civil rights movement. While the equity and inclusion strand draws upon interculturalist ideas, it also addresses such issues as power differentials and privilege. Inclusionists tend to be more willing to support some speech restraints, such as by establishing community norms. The third strand, critical theory, has historical roots that stretch back to the Institute for Social Research at Goethe University of Frankfurt in the 1920s. Focusing on structures of inequality, critical theorists reject free expressions status as an assumed virtue. Because many critical theorists use free speech as a strategy for maintaining inequitable group power differentials, they advocate greater legal restrictions on expression. Finally, comes the concept of managing diversity, which began in the 1980s. Diversity managerialists seek to create systems in which diversity is both a fundamental value and a contributor to other institutional goals. On college campuses, this includes chief diversity officers and Title IX directors. Now, diversity managers may draw upon ideas from interculturalism, equity, inclusion, and critical theory, but they also face one additional imperative, to protect their institutions. And in higher education, they always have to deal with one other factor, academic freedom. More accurately, academic prerogatives because academic free speech is not free either. So have diversity efforts succeeded in restraining speech in the legal realm? Not particularly. First Amendment protections remain. But in the walk around world of campus values, diversity is winning in a rout. Surveys of college students consistently document this phenomenon. When asked the virtue signaling question, do you support speech, free speech? College students tend to answer yes. But when asked about specifics, speakers who not, should not be invited to campus, things other students should not be permitted to say, classroom language that professors should not be allowed to use, students overwhelmingly support targeted speech restrictions. Colleges often make things more complicated for themselves. On their websites, they post sweeping statements supporting free speech and supporting diversity without recognizing they may actually be pitting them against each other. The proverbial self-inflicted wound. So as a diversity consultant, here's what I now advise. Until you get your act together, refrain from proclaiming your support for either free speech or diversity. Do not adopt the Chicago principles on freedom of speech. Do not respond to campus incidents with some empty, meaningless performative acts like mandating campus-wide implicit bias training. Instead, first pursue a two-stage process for clarifying how your campus addresses the relationship between diversity and speech. Begin not with the law, but with aspirations, discussions about principles concerning the speech diversity relationship. I now ask institutional leaders and others, including students, to address the following two questions. One, in order to foster greater equity and inclusion, what limitations on speech should be considered? Two, in order to foster robust speech, in what respect should personal discomfort and even offense be recognized as inevitable aspects of life? By simultaneously addressing these two uncomfortable questions, Figure out your principles. Then at the second stage, address legal constraints such as the First Amendment. Then consider such things as additional diversity training and programs that actually further the kind of campus you want. This two-step approach has many advantages. First, it can lead to more coherent public statements about a university's principles on diversity and speech to clearer presentations to prospective students and families, such as its student orientations, to more nuanced, less knee-jerk administrative decision-making, certainly to better guidance for faculty, staff, students, and administrators. And maybe, as I wind up, most important, it can help students go forth as better civic participants, hopefully as champions of both noble, noble imperatives robust speech, and inclusive, equitable diversity. Thank you very much, Dr. Cortez. 
Our next speaker is Suzanne Nossel. She is the Chief Executive Officer of PEN America, an organization that is devoted to international human rights and freedom of expression. She's the former Chief Executive Officer of Human Rights Watch, Executive Director of Amnesty International, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Organizations under the Obama Administration, and author of Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All. She's also a contributor to PEN America's 2019 report entitled Chasm in the Classroom, Campus Free Speech in a Divided America. Suzanne. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, great to be here. The First Amendment wasn't written for me. Those words were spoken by a student leader from a top public college when she was asked at one of our events whether she would approve of the university rescinding an invitation to a speaker known for racially offensive views. She was asked if such a cancellation would raise concerns under the First Amendment. First Amendment wasn't written for me. I found her words jarring to hear. She's a young, educated, talented person who seemed so alienated from and indifferent to this fundamental freedom that underpins our Bill of Rights, our democracy, our society. I sort of felt the, the former law student in me cringe. But gradually listening to her, I came to understand that the First Amendment wasn't written for me, meant two things. First of all, she meant that as a black woman, her forebears would, not, would have been considered three-fourths of a person at the time the constitution was penned. So when rights were being handed out and guaranteed, they would not have been at the table. She meant something else too. On college campuses these days, very often when the First Amendment is invoked, it's to protect speech that's offensive to a particular group. Could be a right-leaning speaker glorifying the Confederacy, a message like build a wall or ban Muslims to keep the terrorists out, or a racial slur. Such speech is, of course, protected by the First Amendment. But when the only time the amendment seems to come up is to safeguard speech that you find offensive, you might start to wonder whether this amendment was written for you. So I run a free speech organization called PEN America, and our job is to defend freedom of speech and open marketplace for ideas, academic freedom, and even the right to offend. But we also have a mission dating back to 1948's PEN Charter to dispel hatreds and fight against hateful sentiment that courses through society. And so over the last few years, we have become alarmed at what's happening on college campuses on the free speech side. Invitations to speakers being withdrawn in the face of protests, students on some campuses calling for their dorms and dining halls to be designated as safe spaces where uncomfortable ideas and opinions are considered out of bounds. Some campuses have listed out so-called microaggressions and warned people not to say them, Fleeting, usually innocent offenses of speech, like asking someone who looks different, where are you from? Or funny, you don't seem Jewish. Others have imposed speech codes or required professors to put so-called trigger warnings into their syllabuses to put students on notice that course material about rape or abuse or another topic might be upsetting. In some instances, controversies over offensive speakers have erupted into actual physical violence. Elsewhere, professors and administrators have been put on leave demoted or even fired from their jobs for saying the wrong thing, including in many instances where it's clear their intentions were benign and their apologies fulsome. The Princeton and anthropology course about offensive symbols had to be canceled mid-semester after students walked out to protest the professors saying the N-word. This was in a class about offensive speech. So for some people kind of my age, uh, this can seem kind of confounding because isn't the whole point of college to encounter all sorts of people, opinions and ideas, to get out of your comfort zone, to have your values be tested, to get into some of the best intellectual arguments of your life, to encounter people from all over the world and all walks of life. The very idea that college is supposed to be safe, that there shouldn't be triggers that might upset you, that offensive ideas should be kept off campus, seems to run counter to what the university is all about. So, What's going on? Have America's college students taken leave of their senses? Are administrators abdicating their core role as guardians of intellectual freedom in order to placate students, avoid antagonizing parents, and avert controversy? Are faculty members cowering in fear, scrubbing their syllabuses of anything that might elicit a whiff of complaint? 
Just the other day, a friend of mine told me he's no longer going to teach on an adjunct basis at his alma mater, an Ivy League university, where he's been teaching proudly for years because he judges the risk of saying something wrong or being misunderstood in the classroom as too great and frankly, just not worth it. So at PET America some years ago, we, sent, we set out to examine these questions and try to understand why treasured values of free speech and academic inquiry seem to be in jeopardy. And as with many contentious issues, it turns out the debate over campus speech is more complex than it seems. And as always, context matters. A couple of points of relevant context. First, the campus population is changing dramatically. We have more first-generation students in college, an increasing proportion of universities with student bodies where there's no single dominant racial or ethnic group. That's true across America's public schools as a whole, and it will soon be true of our university population. So the assimilationist model that prevailed for decades since campuses first began to integrate in the 1960s is being challenged and superseded by a press from increasingly diverse student bodies and faculty that the universities revisit traditions and established practices to take better account of the needs of students today. This could be students for whom going home over break could, should not be an expectation, students who've had personal experience of violence, abuse, or harassment, students who want to study the work of artists and writers who've historically been left off curricula, students who've invented their own pronouns, students who expect new norms to govern in sexual encounters. So to some from an older generation, these changes can seem misguided and unjustified. What about great books and Western civilization? What about romance and seduction, men's and women's rooms? But look through another, looking through another lens, these students are actually pushing forward to the next phase of the civil rights, women's rights, the racial justice movements that have been ongoing for decades or even centuries. Why should they accept institutions that still remain largely as they were originally conceived to cater to homogenous populations of upper-class white men? Mores and expectations change. The next generation is gonna inherit our society. As we teach and groom them, it behooves us to listen to them to the extent that they're arguing that populations and groups ought to have more of a say in how they are described and treated. Would we really disagree? A second, sorry about that, a second piece of content to text that has been eye-opening for me to understand relates to the level of bias and discrimination that still pervades on campus. According to the Anti-Defamation League, White supremacist propaganda distribution more than doubled in the United States in 2019, totaling 2,713 reported cases nationwide, compared to just 1,200 in, in 2018, the year before. And it had actually been climbing up uh, before that, so the increases over a longer period are close to exponential. Students have described to us nooses being hung on trees in campuses, racist posts in dorms about the need to defend the white heterosexual family, uh, you know, incidents where one student told me recently about uh, a professor using the N-word in class. He, he meant it as a pedagogical moment, but the students were shaken and offended. And when they brought it up, the professor was asked by his department chair to discuss the, 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 the use of the word in class. So he turned to the only Black student in the course to explain to others why it was offensive. And a short time later, when they were doing a role play, that student was assigned the role of a civil rights rabble rouser. Students have told me that when racist incidents happen on campus, people inevitably turn to students of color to explain why they're offended, to rebut noxious arguments, and to answer what should be done to remedy the situation. They've explained to me that this work takes a toll and can amount to a whole additional load of responsibilities on top of the students' academic and extracurricular obligations. In the current climate with hate speech on the rise, the burdens are heightened. These are aspects of the context of our current debates that help inform how we understand them. So what are some of the answers here? Can the campus meet its dual obligations to be more inclusive and equitable for students from a wide range of backgrounds while maintaining uncompromising protections for free speech? Can our universities be truly open both to all people and to all ideas? There are no simple answers, though I think half the battle is simply recognizing that these two set of, sets of obligations can and, and must coexist. And I was glad, glad to hear Carlos uh, stress a similar theme. A few specific points. On the question of campus speakers, when an outrageous uh, speaker, uh, a provocateur, 
manages to wrangle an invitation to come to a college campus, what they want more than anything else is to be shut down or shouted down. If that happens, they can grandstand, they can fundraise by tapping into the outrage of their supporters. They may be even be able to file a lawsuit. So oftentimes the worst thing to do is disinvite them. If a, an invitation has been properly extended, I think the university should uh, uh, only on the perhaps the very rarest of circumstances uh, rescind it or uh, uh, deny the person the opportunity to come and speak. That said, the university doesn't need to simply throw up its hands and, and, and kind of cry its, its free speech. Having a speaker come to campus and speak to a packed room with an offensive and denigrated message can make students feel demoralized and targeted. It can feel as if all the values of tolerance and inclusion in the university brochure have suddenly gone out the window. So what the university needs to do in these situations is recognize a dual role. Yes, it's a forum for free speech, even when that speech may be offensive, but it's also a speaker in its own right, a proponent and defender of certain values. When white supremacist Richard Spencer came to the University of Florida, the administration launched hashtags Together UF and Gators Not Haters. A counter speech rally was organized and the, the, the Spencer speech was scheduled for the far reaches of campus and went off without a hitch with a half empty room. No violence, no lawsuits. When it comes to safe spaces, it's also not a strict either or. We can all agree that college should be physically safe for all students. There's some forms of speech, including threats, harassment and racist bullying that are already prohibited uh, under our civil rights laws. Also, students should be be free to create safe spaces of their own, a lunch table where LGBTQ issues are discussed supportively, or one that's for backers of a particular political party. That's freedom of association, a protected constitutional right under the very same First Amendment. But these spaces should be entered into voluntarily and knowingly. You shouldn't sit down only to find that your views make you unwelcome, nor should the whole dining hall, dormitory, or campus be dubbed a safe space from certain notions. While students should be free to meet and congregate with those they agree with, part of the function of those clubs and interest groups should be to support students as they encounter those with whom they disagree and even those who may harbor ideas they consider unsafe. A few concluding thoughts. When we discuss free speech on campus, we're talking about much more than the First Amendment. When it comes to private universities, the First Amendment doesn't generally apply at all. Even at public universities, many of the conflicts that erupt over students' social media accounts or speech that is rankling but doesn't rise to the level of warranting discipline don't implicate the First Amendment. So we have to navigate uh, as a society how we can live together and what rules we want to adopt in our diverse, digitized, and divided society to uphold free speech but also uh, not be in an environment where in, we're in perpetual friction and conflict. But the, the, the big concern that I want to leave you with is, is this risk that free speech is becoming increasingly associated with right-leaning causes and only with defending those who offend. So if that's the case, I, I worry that we could face a rising generation of Americans who are alienated from the principle of free speech, who do believe that the First Amendment wasn't written for them. I think we had a vivid, vivid illustration last summer during the Black Lives Matter protests and all the conflicts with police about whether, where and how people could protest and how, uh, what the responsibilities of our authorities were in trying to keep the peace, uh, you know, of, of just how important our First Amendment freedoms are. Uh, that's what enabled people to march out in the streets, even during uh, a global pandemic, to express themselves and to catalyze an incredibly powerful movement of, uh, for change that has led to reforms at police departments, all over the country that has you know, fundamentally altered the agenda of the, the Biden administration now in office. So that the power of speech and the importance of free speech rights to the left, to social justice movements were so vividly in evidence. And, and that gives me some hope uh, of being able to bring across to a rising generation that free speech ought to be one of the causes that they are fighting for. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Robert Mark Simpson. He is an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at University College London and the author of The Relation Between Academic Freedom and Freedom of Speech, uh, Free Speech rather. Uh, Dr. Simpson. 
Uh, well, thanks for the introduction, uh, Dan, and thanks to the Tompkin Thompson Centre for the invitation and to the, the three speakers who've come before me, Greg and Carlos and Suzanne, for those presentations. It's great to, to be here in such esteemed company. And as you'll hear, I'm not, uh, I'm not an American. I'm from Australia and I work in the UK, so I feel like a bit of a visitor today. Uh, I'll try to, um, you know, be a, a well-behaved visitor and polite visitor. I think I was... Uh, invited to speak here under the expectation I'd probably say something that might be a bit outside the, the mainstream or the norm of what people talking about free speech universities and these kinds of discussions ordinarily say. Uh, and that may well end up being the case. But I thought I might start by echoing some, some points that I agree with that the speakers um, we've heard from already have kind of uh, voiced. Um, so first off, uh, I, I definitely don't want to be taken as denying that there are conformist pressures at work and thought policing uh, going on in liberal democratic societies today that are damaging the intellectual culture of universities in the United States and other countries. I think that's true. I think there is a real problem. Some, some rhetoric about that problem, I think, exaggerates to some degree, at least some of the time, but I don't deny that there is a very real problem. Um, and there's a question about the magnitude of the problem and how it compares to, you know, what the historical trajectory is here. But I'm not one of these people going around saying, no, there's nothing to see here. Um, I think it's worth emphasizing, moreover, that the, the, the kind of cultural problems in universities that we're talking about, they don't only affect the lived experience of students on campus, although that's a very important part of the, the, the issue. They also affect the research culture of academic departments in a way that throws, uh, poses a real threat to their intellectual integrity. Uh, now, I agree with uh, the, both of the, the two speakers um, who've come before me. Um, that there are constructive ways to deal with diversity pushes, for want of a better word. Um, I don't think that the push to diversify university communities or to decolonize the curriculum are fundamentally the source of the threats to the intellectual integrity of universities that we're talking about today. I think it's true that there are extreme manifestations of these kinds of decolonized movements that do reject the idea of academic freedom or even the idea of free speech at university. Um, but the fact that there are some people within these movements who reject the idea of academic freedom doesn't mean that the movements themselves are fundamentally incompatible with a commitment to academic freedom. And I think a lot of the interesting work is, just as, um, as Carlos and Suzanne have been saying, thinking about how to affect a kind of rapprochement between the, the kind of competing desiderata here. Um, I think the real fundamental source of the threat to the intellectual culture of universities today is the, the total breakdown of trust and communication amongst different political uh, factions within countries like the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, I think that's the, this problem of polarization is the great problem for, for liberal democracies today. And inevitably universities are one of the sites at which that conflict plays out. So, so hopefully everything I've said so far seems like fairly, uh, fairly you know, sensible and reasonable and within the bounds of the kinds of things people often say about these things. The thing that I want to say that's maybe um, li liable to be surprising or uh, disagreeable to some people is that I think there is a tendency when we're talking about these problems to, um, to distort the kind of institution, uh, pre pre present a distorted understanding of the kind of institution that a university is supposed to be. And that distortion comes out in the way that commentators frequently conflate questions about free speech and questions about academic freedoms, because if these two things are essentially or fundamentally the very same question, and I think that's wrong. Um, so let me try to explain why. Uh, and let me come to this by way, uh, sort of indirectly by talking about a couple of uh, examples. Um, I guess I want to pose the question, why do we allow disciplinary gatekeeping in our academic journals and in our academic publishing? So in order to get a, a paper published in a, a journal, it has to pass peer review. And as anyone who's ever tried to get a paper published in a peer reviewed journal knows, this is incredibly discouraging. It feels like you can't say anything. It feels like every idea you have is being snipped back out from various different angles. And even if the referees like the paper, if it's a very prestigious journal, uh, it might be rejected all the same. Um, the, the whole kind of process of academic publishing is one that's shot through with very, very onerous gatekeeping. Uh, now, if you buy the classical social epistemological account of John Stuart Mill, which is kind of the foundation of classical liberal free speech theory, and through its influence on um, First Amendment jurisprudence in the first half of the 20th century, kind of one of the formative ideas of um, uh, First Amendment jurisprudence in America, if you buy Mill's social epistemology, the gatekeeping that we do at academic journals and other forms of academic publishing seems 
misguided or indeed fundamentally benighted. Because what we're supposed to be doing, if we want to promote our intellectual aims of discovering the truth and understanding our justifications for believing what we believe, is letting all of the ideas be expressed in a, in a widely accessible way, including ideas that are uh, <laughs> ill-informed or, or downright incoherent, completely offensive. We're just supposed to admit all of the ideas into the arena of public discussion. And the thought is that the discriminating audience members will exercise their judgment to figure out which of, which of the ideas are credible and worth taking seriously and which aren't. And that's manifestly not what we do with academic publishing. Rather, we appoint credential experts to act as gatekeepers and try to sift the good ideas from the bad ideas. And that's that is quite inimical to the ethos of a free speech principle, which is supposed to be indiscriminate with respect to the content of views. To take another example, think about the kind of disciplinary gatekeeping that we do in the awarding of PhDs. Right? This is how we credential the next range of academic uh, experts to run universities, to do the teaching and research activities. What do we do to get them there? Well, we have this whole PhD process where you have to satisfy a bunch of disciplinary gatekeepers that you're a competent exponent of the relevant discipline and that your ideas can be taken seriously and defended with reference to the disciplinary standards. Now, again, if a million social epistemology is the right social epistemology, this seems like a questionable method of trying to pursue our, our intellectual aims, right? Because the, the formula for Mill is let all of the ideas be heard and then the audience will decide which of the ideas are good, bad, credible, incredible, etc. We're not supposed to have experts and gatekeepers sifting the ideas and telling us in advance, no, these people are coots and these people are serious experts. The audience is supposed to be the one doing that kind of discriminatory judgment under their own steam. So once again, we have a, a system of academic practice that seems to evince an ethos that's quite in tension with the, the, the kind of core ethos of a free speech principle, which is supposed to be indiscriminate with respect to the content of the views. Now, I think this is a real problem for the thought that universities are simply supposed to be a place where free speech happens in some sort of simplistic way, because it seems evident to me that universities have done enormous good in promote, uh, promoting and achieving our shared intellectual aims. You look at disciplines where there can be some sort of technological evidence of the, the success of the inquiry, and it seems like the sorts of practices I've been describing, PhD, gatekeeping in PhDs, gatekeeping in academic publishing, are part of collective epistemic endeavors that have been incredibly fruitful, you know, wildly successful. Um, and you have this, the very same structures that are responsible for those successes in the natural sciences and in engineering and other fields, the same kinds of structures are in place for fields in the humanities and social science. Uh, you might even go so far as to argue that the preeminence of the American higher education sector is a testament to the intellectual value of gatekeeping as a part of academic life. Now, does this mean that gatekeeping should happen along ideological or political lines? Obviously not. The operation of academic disciplines is supposed to be intellectually discriminating, but ideologically indiscriminate. So the fact that someone's views are deemed ethically deficient by the existing experts is no reason to exclude their work from a journal or refuse to grant them a PhD. But on the other hand, the fact that someone's views are intellectually deficient, that they fail to demonstrate the forms of knowledge and methodological competence that define the relevant field of inquiry, this is a very good reason to exclude their work from a journal or to, to refuse to grant them a PhD. There's no way to run a university without doing all this. So when we speak about academic freedom and free speech as if they're the same thing, I think we obscure this important difference between the culture of a liberal public sphere at large and the culture of a university in particular. Academic freedom is not just free speech at a university. Academic freedom protects the right of academics to conduct, conduct their professional business in teaching, research and extramural expression in a way that's free from interference by government, university management, external donors and pressure groups and others. Credential appointees in academic jobs have to be free to exercise their expertise in how they work and insulated against the threat of professional penalties for running afoul of the moral and political ideals of others. However, in the exercise of that expertise, academics uh, experts will not, and indeed they should not, exhibit a wide open indiscriminate attitude to the ideas that they're involved in teaching and assessing. It's an inbuilt part of their job to discriminate between ideas that are intellectually competent and those that aren't. In other words, the exercise of academic freedom involves forms of content-based discrimination that are inimical to the content-neutral requirements of a general legal or political principle of free speech. So what are the implications of this for campus life? Well, the natural thing to say is there's just two different things that go on at universities. There's the academic stuff, 
where we allow for intellectual discrimination. And then there's the rest of the campus where we have free speech. So can you exclude Holocaust deniers from coming to give a presentation to the history uh, research department seminar? Absolutely. The professors in the history department agree that the Holocaust deniers are just incompetent historians with little of value to contribute to the seminar, then it's their prerogative and indeed their responsibility to exclude those people and invite competent people to come and speak. But can you exclude Holocaust deniers from handing out leaflets around the campus? Well, it might depend on the details of the case, but on a view that says free speech is a crucial part of campus life, the thought is, well, maybe not. Maybe this is just part of the public sphere and we have to accept that there will be hateful views disseminated in the public sphere. Now, the positive story to tell about how these two zones coexist is that the free speech culture that exists over here promotes the aims of academic disciplines that are practiced over here. Um, and there's an argument to that effect in recent influential work um, by Owen Chemerinsky on this topic and Howard Gilman. Um, I don't think this argument about the interaction between free speech and academic freedom in universities is completely bogus, but I think it's a bit speculative. It's not obviously true and it's hostage to empirical fortune. I think there are at least some reasons to worry that when these two discursive arenas are operating side by side, the totally unregulated discursive community in fact tends to undermine the culture of the disciplinary intellectual communities. So let me tell you a very brief story about why this might be the case and then I'll finish. It's because unregulated discursive communities seem to give rise to tribalized clusters who view outsiders with deep mistrust and suspicion. Once that mistrust is deeply embedded, it breeds a tendency for us to assume that anyone who disagrees with our strongly held views is in fact arguing in bad faith. And once you start assuming that anyone who disagrees with you is arguing in bad faith, it becomes extraordinarily difficult to have constructive dialogue along lines of, across lines of disagreement. See, for example, what most social media networks are like nowadays. So what I want to say is that the disciplined character of academic discursive communities is in fact a kind of antidote to this form of intellectual breakdown. I find it far too optimistic and Pollyanna-ish when I read people talking about the culture of free speech in universities as if it's just a priori obvious that free speech on campus ultimately encourages open-mindedness and tolerance in academic communities. I think there are just as many reasons to think that the influence actually runs in the opposite direction. Now, this isn't meant to be an uh, apologetics for any and every form of ideological conformism and cancellation and disinvitation. I said at the start that I think those things are problems and I mean that, but it's meant to open us up to the possibility that some restrictions on free speech at universities are justifiable, not in spite of, but because of our commitment to a certain kind of intellectual project, which it's the university's job to carry out. The paradigmatic example of this would be the decision to discourage the platforming of people who are manifestly trying to subvert and undermine the intellectual integrity of universities. People like Milo Yiannopoulos from a few years ago, or shield and shields and paid operators who are in the service of powerful lobby groups and who are aiming to suppress the truth rather than seeking it. The optimistic classical liberal view is that we should listen to these people and our intellectual aims will be advanced as we figure out why they're wrong. To which I say, if that's the right approach, why don't we do exactly the same with academic journals or with PhD committees? Uh, I, and I'll, I'll leave that question dangling. I run out of time, but uh, we Thank might come back to that. In Thank you. Our next speaker is Christina Olstadt. She is Dean of Students here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has over 20 years of experience in higher education administration as a former interim assistant vice president to student affairs, housing and residence life at Townsend University, former assistant to the vice president for student affairs at Townsend University and various other positions. Dean Olstadt. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I first you know, wanna take a moment to thank the Tommy Thompson Center for providing this opportunity today to engage in the discussion of the First Amendment on college campuses. You know, I'm honored for the opportunity to serve on this panel and to share my thoughts and experiences in a variety of roles I've served in over my career in student affairs and working directly with students. In my role as a Dean of Students, I serve uh, or oversee the student advocacy portfolio including the Center for the First Year Experience, Associated Students of Madison, Dean of Students Office, Office of Student Conduct and Community Standards and Parent and Family Program. Encompassed within this position also includes areas around bias response, protest response, orientation programs, and working directly with our student government. Here at UW-Madison, the total student experience both inside and outside the classroom is referred to as the Wisconsin experience which focuses on four pillar areas, empathy and humility, relentless curiosity, intellectual confidence and purposeful action. 
for empathy and humility. Badgers bring heart to everything that we do. We develop and demonstrate a cultural understanding of ourselves and others. We engage locally, nationally, and globally in a respectful and civil manner. And we appreciate and celebrate one another's abilities, views, and accomplishments. Badgers show relentless curiosity at every step of life's journey. We question things that no one has ever thought to question. We actively learn with expert instructors, scholars, and peers. We engage in creative inquiry, scholarship, and research. We develop resilience, and we foster courage in life and learning. Badgers fearlessly sift and winnow until we achieve intellectual confidence. At our core, we're learners and teachers. We develop confidence, depth, and expertise in a field of study. We integrate ideas and synthesize knowledge across multiple contexts, and we exercise critical thinking and effective communication. And we strive um, every day through purposeful action. We work for the common good, for something that's bigger than ourselves. We apply knowledge and skills to solve problems, engage in public service, partner with others, and contribute to the community, and we lead for positive change. UW-Madison has a strong history of student activism, engagement, and protest on campus and in the community. And during my first two years on campus, our students have engaged in numerous protests of the campus, departmental decisions, and within the Madison community. Our students seek out opportunities to exercise their First Amendment rights, and as an administrator, it is my role to support our students in their rights and responsibilities. One book that I found particularly powerful around free speech is Nadine Strawson's book released in 2018 titled Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship, which talks about the importance of free speech in the United States and being able to challenge hate speech with more speech. Often with speech codes and restrictions of speech, the very groups that are impacted the most and restricted with those very codes are marginalized populations. As an administrator, it's important to protect our students' right to free speech and to also be able to share how the institution um, or as an individual, we disagree with that speech and what was said, how it may violate our values, but that we are supportive of the individual's right to say it. We also have an obligation to acknowledge the impact of the speech and provide support to affected students, uh, such as a processing space after a white nationalist group posted flyers with hateful rhetoric directed towards marginalized students. It's important to reiterate that if speech is regulated, the very groups who are often affected or targeted by hateful and objectionable speech are the ones censored disproportionately. Nadine Strawson mentions that due to the inherent subjectivity of the subject of hate speech, and what is considered by some as hate speech is loving speech by others, it's important to leave the decision up to the individual and not delegate it to the government. As an institution, there are a variety of ways that we engage to educate around the First Amendment, including offering panels such as the one we all find ourselves in today. In addition, we are constantly seeking ways to engage with students through coursework, conversations with student leaders, and through our bias response process to educate and engage around the First Amendment. As an institution, we send messages about our protest guidelines to make sure students are aware of the guidelines and set up for success for their events. We also work collaboratively with student organizations around responding to and navigating potential disruptions at events. As a university administrator, having worked in the field of student affairs for the past 21 years at six different campus communities, I have at times had students question or call for the removal of a student due to hate speech. However, after engaging in a dialogue about the First Amendment rights of our students and what is protected under the First Amendment, students have a better understanding of why as an institution, we do not restrict or limit the speech of another. Each fall, we receive a number of emails and messages, typically from non-UW-Madison affiliates, 
sent to us about posts of incoming students um, and concerning things that they have shared. We see these as an educational opportunity to engage with our future Badgers, um, including the reporter and the individual being reported. We see ourselves as an educational institution and seek uh, to find understanding through dialogue. Referring to the survey conducted by the Tommy Thompson Center in the fall of 2020, a few stats stuck out to me to reiterate, in my opinion, that the majority of our students do understand the importance of the First Amendment and free speech on campus. Now there is more work to do and we'll get into that later in our Q&A. Uh, when students were asked, how much do you agree or disagree with the following statement? Public institutions should revoke invitations to guest speakers when the speaker's remarks would likely offend some people. Only 6.6% of our students indicated that they strongly agreed. And if you know students that had some level of agreement, that was 34.6%. So overwhelming majority of our students did not think that we should revoke invitations. Only 4.3% of students strongly disagreed with the statement uh, speech should not be regulated even when it makes others feel uncomfortable. Uh, students also indicated 60% that they strongly agreed with the statement one person should not be able to prevent another person from speaking because they hold an opposing view. And when adding in somewhat agree and slightly agree, that number is 88.4% of students agreeing with the statement. As an institution, our role is to engage and educate our students, to provide opportunities to learn with and from each other, to challenge each other, to sift and winnow, to get to deeper levels of understanding. And as a Dean of Students, I'm committed to continually engaging with our students to do exactly that, continue the conversation and to educate our community about their rights and responsibilities as a member of the UW-Madison community. I appreciate the offer to engage with this panel and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you so much, Christina, Dr. Olstead. Um, we do have a few questions that some members of the audience have posed. I wanna invite all of you to uh, post any questions you have through the Q&A feature on Zoom. Um, I promised at the beginning that we would pass along the first CLE passcode at this point in the program. And I am informed that the passcode is civics, that's capital C-I-V-I-C-S, civics. Um, so uh, I presume that those of you who are getting CLA credit know what to do with this. Um, we've got about 52 minutes left in the program. Oh, there we go. Um, it was just flashed up for a moment briefly. Um, but we've got about 52 minutes left in the program. I'm gonna uh, pose a question and, and maybe try to weave in some of the various questions that we've received so far and will be receiving, I'm sure, more of in the remainder of the program. The first question I'd like to ask concerns the relationship between our diversity, equity, and inclusion goals and freedom of speech, which was a theme running th throughout several of your remarks. I see we have a young free speech advocate joining us. Um, uh, so um, public universities, private universities as well, um, in, and, and I would emphatically include this university, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, are emphatically committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that includes racial justice. Uh, I would note here that in the state immediately to our west, uh, Minnesota, right across the Mississippi River, the trial of the police officer who uh, brutally killed George Floyd is going on right now. We saw just a few days ago, the killing of another black man, Dante White, by a police officer just outside Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, these events have increasingly prompted people within universities to see racial justice as a part of our mission and to feel a responsibility 
to use our voices to advance racial justice. As, as Suzanne noted in her remarks, we as universities and as university leaders um, can use our voices. We are speakers in our own right, as well as being forums for speech. Uh, but there are sometimes tensions that arise between our diversity, equity, and inclusion objectives, especially when it comes to equity for people of color, for women, for LGBTQ plus people. Um, there is tension between our objectives of, of ensuring equity for these and other subordinated, traditionally subordinated groups and freedom of speech. So uh, what should we be doing about this? And let me just divide this up into two parts and invite any of you to comment on, and I'll make this a jump ball question. What should we as university administrators be doing um, to, because I think most of us really do want to affirmatively per, per, um, pursue both of these values when things are said on campus um, that might be harmful, that might create a less racially inclusive environment or an environment that is hostile to LGBTQ plus people, for example. What should we as university administrators be doing? Uh, Dr. Cortez uh, gave some of his thoughts on that, but I'd really love to hear more on that from all of you. And then the second question is, how should students respond when there are when there is speech on campus, whether it's from an invited speaker, a professor, or a fellow student that they find objectionable, that they find to be subordinating to certain people or groups. So I'll just throw that up in the air. Any of you should feel free to just go ahead and chime on in. I'm happy to jump in on sort of what I think universities should do. It's And it's, it's really, a subject I deal with in, in my book, Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All. In it, I outline sort of 20 principles for how I think we can live together in our diverse, digitized, and divided society without impinging upon free speech. And, you know, in a sense, it's, 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 it's putting forward a vision of free speech that I think can help us bridge across these sometimes competing principles. The first uh, principle that I articulate is conscientiousness with language, the idea that we all, just as, as people living together in society, have a certain obligation to think about the words we use and understand how they're gonna land, to know something about the audiences who we are engaging with, you know, what their hot buttons are, how they like to dis be described, uh, you know, what terms are coming uh, in and out of use. And, and the second chapter is actually about a heightened duty of care that I believe attaches when you have a powerful platform. If you have your own talk show or podcast or you're in front of a, a, a lecture hall, I think that the duty is extra. There's a case that, you know, for me, sort of really underscores this that uh, was made public this week of a uh, adjunct lecturer at Columbia who used the N word uh, in talking about a, an incident, uh, uh, you know, in a courtroom years ago with a kind of a KKK client. And this uh, professor sort of repeated the words many, the word, you know, I think 11 times in 30 seconds uh, in this very animated way. And, you know, what I thought is, you know, how after sort of what happened to Jeff Stone, what happened to Don McNeil, what happened to Mike Pesca, you know, and in some instances, you know, people, uh, you know, in the Don McNeil uh, incident in the New York Times issued a statement saying, I thought it was very problematic that the Times had said intent and context didn't matter. Uh, in, in Don McNeil, this longtime Times reporter, uh, losing his job. But I, I do think if someone's teaching at Columbia, you know, there's some, in, it's kind of incumbent on you, you're teaching a class on hate speech to be have some awareness of how these terms land and how the, you know, the import of the N-word has changed and what it means to a rising generation. Uh, you know, that, that I think is just something that, you know, we sort of have to take on. So I try to outline the book, you know, a series of things to think about and be aware of, being aware of the harms of speech. You know, I, I think free speech defenders and Greg and I have sort of gone back and forth on this, have been sometimes a bit hesitant to 
acknowledge the harms of speech for fear that in so doing, we will open up the door to censorship. And I understand that, but I actually think it's a more credible defense of free speech to recognize that particularly when hateful speech has been pervasive in someone's life, they've been subject to slurs uh, and, and, and discriminatory bigoted expression, that that can have real psychological uh, and even physiological consequences. And I think that's something your professors should be made aware of. Yeah, um, you know, I, 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 oh, I, 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 yeah, I, I mean, for me, a lot of this tension, I would be much more comfortable with the idea of there being so much tension between free speech and inclusion if I felt like K through 12 and higher education was doing a good job of explaining uh, principles of free speech and principles, more importantly, as, uh, as one of our speakers pointed out, the distinction between um, everyday free speech and academic freedom, because what were what I, I feel like to a degree universities have lost the thread that essentially this is supposed to be an institution in which you're supposed to figure go through the arduous process of knowing what the world looks like and this requires devil's advocacy this requires thought experimentation it requires taking seriously the possibility you might be wrong and it requires almost infinite curiosity um, and this is why I talk about the real motivation for free speech. The, the most profound motivation for free speech is simply to know the world as it is. And that, and that doesn't mean just uh, mildly the bad. It means understanding where hateful people are coming from. It means understanding what QAnon is. All of these kind of very difficult things. And then we lament, oh, the students, they're, they're, uh, they're angry that people are saying horrible things. In some cases, they really are. But we, what we've told them, we, you, you have a bias-related incident uh, uh, program at your school. Go report them to the bias-related. Something bad has happened to you. Um, we've created the expectation that they're not supposed to be offended um, on campus, which is completely wrong. So I feel like we've created some of this problem ourselves, administrators in K through 12 and in higher education. And unless and until they actually, when as soon as, as students set up on campus, they explain, this is a strange thing we're doing here. And it requires a certain amount of detachment. It requires in infinite curiosity, and it requires a commitment to simply knowing the world the way it is, why people think what they do, because you cannot engage in the project of human knowledge without being curious about what people gen genuinely think. So I think personally, we're, we're going about this the wrong way and then being surprised and disappointed at the, at the results, because we've, we've created expectations that do not match what the expectations should be when you enter such a peculiar institution as, uh, as higher education itself. Thanks. Dr. Cortez. No, I, I was, was picking up on Susan, but I, now Greg's jumped in too. Uh, I, I think uh, the defenders of free speech undermine their own arguments by overusing the word free. In describing situations which are patently unfree, it's as if free speech defenders have a hard time saying the word speech without injecting free in front of it. And free is an important word. I agree with Greg. And this is, I agree with Susan. But I think so many people defending free speech talk about a situation in which they are patent. They'll say things like, we need community norms to defend free speech. You set up community norms to guide speech, you're already intruding on speech. Uh, but the inability of free speech defenders to get out of their own way and just be able to talk about speech without connecting it to free as if they were a single undivided term gets in the way of conversations. Because I think the, the way, and I agree with Greg, that the university is doing it wrong. I think the way you do it is, is the way I was talking about is get people to walk in and say, I'm not going to throw the free word at you every time you say something I disagree with. And I'm not going to throw in trauma, microaggressions, implicit bias every time the conversation doesn't go my way. And I'm finding both diversity defenders and free speech defenders have a terrible time restraining themselves. How much of the things um, that we've seen going on on campus, such as disinvitations, is traceable to the rise in political polarization, which uh, which Robert alluded to. I mean, this is documented. We have indeed seen a dramatic rise in polarization in recent decades, not just 
people on opposite sides of the fence here in the United States, Democrats and Republicans, believing certain things, not just a growing difference there, but what political scientists refer to as effective polarization, basically mutual trust and dislike, even contempt for one another. We no longer see each other as fellow citizens with whom we have respectful disagreements, but as the enemy, Greg in his book refers to, talks a lot about the us versus them politics that we have nowadays. And so I wonder how much what's going on campus now, as well as if we look to the other side of the political spectrum, just say the January 6th insurrection, um, how much of, of, of these things is traceable to the rise in political polarization, especially effective polarization. Greg, I see you're, you're nodding your head, so I'm gonna invite you to speak first. Uh, polarization it, it, it is, is so extremely important to understand what's going on in the world at the moment, in the world, uh, period. Uh, the fact that we're sorting and increasingly able to sort ourselves, uh, partially due to decentralization of cities, people are moving to, to the country, people, um, but also the fact that we can organize ourselves in um, virtual uh, groups has accelerated polarization. Polarization was increasing even without technology, but that's made it even more intense. Now, you look at the academy, and, you, and I wrote a book called Coddling the American Mind. We have a whole chapter on how polarization is making everything worse. But one of the things that, that really concerns me is that, and it was something that I, 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 I kind of uh, tried to be neutral on before, was lack of viewpoint diversity in higher education, um, which, and at first that was kind of sneered at as being kind of like, and, and I believe it or not, I'm actually left of center. Um, the, uh, that cons but there, there was this idea that um, having more conservatives on campus was like affirmative action for conservatives or something like that. But when I was doing the book with Jonathan Haidt, I didn't understand that some of these departments are now 30 to one. Um, some history departments. There are there are departments where there are literally no conservatives. Why does this matter? One, uh, as, as one of the speakers mentioned, when you have a, a, a like-minded community, it tends to become a coherent moral community. So, because everybody thinks like them, it tends to spiral away in 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 the group polarization situation. Now, what scares me the most is the fact that. In recent years, I've been seeing professors not just punished for, but, and oftentimes it's they get uh, they, they run afoul of the right when they say something you know uh, inflammatory on Twitter. But on campus, in the past couple of years, for the first time, I'm seeing people getting in trouble for their academic research. I'm seeing people actually getting threats for uh, for, for papers that they produce and then withdrawing them. Why does that matter? Because we look to higher education to tell us what the world really looks like. And if you give people on the right any reason to say, wait a second, so this is this institution is already horribly biased. And if you try to say something that goes against the narrative, you're going to get to use the word canceled. Your, uh, uh, your paper is going to be in trouble. That creates a dangerous distrust of these, ep these epistemic institutions. And I think that we're underestimating how seriously undermining the credibility of journalism, which I think the New York Times, frankly, has done in the past couple of years for incidents like that Susan talked about, but higher education itself. And, I, and I've come around to my, my friend Jonathan Knight's idea that we need greater viewpoint diversity in higher education for higher education's own sake. Yeah, so I'll just make one um, quick comment on this. I mean, the question of, you know, how is polarization interacting with what happens at universities is a really big one. It's an empirical question, which is, you know, um, as a philosopher, I should be, you know, uh, cautious about just speculating wildly on. One thing I will say, though, is that I think that in the way that lots of academics conduct themselves in their professional life and in their extramural speech on social media, I'm constantly disappointed in my uh, peers and colleagues in the sort of unprofessionalism of our demeanor, right? This sense, like if you're a comedian or uh, uh, maybe even if you're, you know, um, an entertainer or some other kind of public figure, the thought that you might, uh, your modus operandi and how you comport yourself in the public sphere might be, you know, trying to own people or humiliate them or make fun at their expense. Okay, fair enough. That might be kind of consonant with the nature of your profession. But, you know, an important part of our profession as academics is sort of modeling and instilling in our students a certain kind of intellectual temperament. And that comes along with a certain kind of um, honorable attitude towards one's intellectual opponents. Now, I have to be cautious in saying this because I think the, you know, one doesn't want to engage in tone policing, right? People who are members of um, oppressed and minoritized communities speaking with outrage about genuinely outrageous injustices, of course, are entitled to, 
you know, express anger in a way that befits the injustice of the situation. But so much of the acrimony and point scoring and kind of the kinds of um, expressions of, of, you know, just gossip and talking about the, you know, the, the ordinary stuff of the news cycle that, that isn't a response to an outrageous injustice. It's just trying essentially to, to engage in the sort of stuff that gets you more social media following. I don't think it's... Um, I don't think it's kind of in line with the right sort of professional ethos that academics should be inculcating. So polarization is bad. Academics should be more kind of, and this kind of um, dovetails with some of what Suzanne was saying, they should be more serious about the power of their own speech to contribute to those kind of forces of polarization. You know, Stan. So one of the pieces I wanna um, kind of highlight, so one of my favorite times on a college campus is uh, around the presidential election. And just, uh, energy and the excitement and, and the debate opportunities on a college campus. And, and during the 2016 presidential election, the amount of um, hateful rhetoric, the amount of people being assaulted for wearing hats on, on the campus that I was at, this is not at UW-Madison, I was on a previous campus, um, was sh alarming and shocking to me and engaging in conversations with students about help me understand what is happening here. And so the, you know, the polarization piece is detrimental uh, in my view to, uh, to where we are today and, and where we find ourselves. You know, when I think about, you know, one of the questions I kind of want to tie back into, it was like what students should do, I think was uh, the piece around um, how students should respond on campus. and. And one of the pieces uh, that you know, I encourage students to do is if there's a viewpoint that you don't agree with, challenge the viewpoint, engage in more speech, you know, have a dialogue with them, get sift and winnow, get to deeper levels of understanding. Um, when, you know, at a previous campus, well, again, not at UW-Madison, but a previous campus, um, we had a, an active group that, um, was classified as a hate group that was not affiliated, but yet there were students and the amount of impact that that had and then managing the impact. So this ties into what administrators can do, you know, engaging in conversations with students, talking about the first amendment, talking about why we have the first amendment uh, and what it protects is so important because, um, you know, oftentimes there's a lot of misconceptions around the First Amendment and what is protected and is not protected. So engaging in those conversations and opportunities like today where we do have various viewpoints represented um, to sift and winnow. And we want students, you know, when students come to campus, they have a lived experience prior to getting to campus. And then we want them to explore, we want them to engage, we want them to be exposed to views that challenge their views and, and to figure out what their views are and how they got to that and find the story. And so that's one of our goals in higher education. So I appreciate the opportunity to respond to that. Thanks, Dr. Olstead. We've got a question here about uh, in, how we might encourage creative ways of engaging in protest um, and, and specifically, protests against hateful speech. Uh, the questioner gives the example of Fred Phelps, a, a uh, someone who was in, engaging in especially noxious and hateful speech towards LGBTQ plus people. Um, and the example is we encourage folks to pledge money, perhaps tied to every minute Phelps spoke with the funds raising raised going to LGBTQIA organizations. Um, that's one example. Can, can you give some advice, any of you, to those who are interested in, um, I guess you might say, alternatives to disinvitation. You know, if, if students really want to make their opposition known in a way that will, um, that will not serve the provocateur's ends, what's the best way of doing that? Ooh, I, uh, can I jump in just real quick? 
Uh, Google um, what happened when Fred Phelps went to Comic Con in San Diego in twenty, like uh, uh, maybe twenty twelve. It was the best counter protest you've ever seen in your life. A bunch of nerds got together and they just made them look. They, it was peaceful and it was just. It made them look so incredibly silly. There, you know, people standing uh, next to Fred Phelps dressed like Bender with a sign saying "Kill all humans." You know, they just made them look ridiculous. So a lot of these more creative attempts, they're much more effective. Um, the one thing I loved was. Um, there was a there was a white nationalist march somewhere and these guys showed up like dressed like dr seuss with tubas and stuff and they played this very sad flight of the valkyries after them just making them look absolutely ridiculous so much more effective uh at at, at uh, undermining what they're trying to say than you know violence for example right i think suzanne and robert and christina all have comments in that order and uh you too carlos so everybody suzanne oh, you first i'll uh, keep it quick yeah, I devote actually a whole chapter in my book to protesting without silencing, because uh, I think it's extremely important that people understand the dangers of the heckler's veto and why you know, we should, no matter the level of our conviction, we should not arrogate to ourselves the power to silence another, because if that stands, you know, we may be the next ones uh, who, are, who, are them, who are silenced. And so there are all kinds of examples of, you know, at Harvard, sort of the draping of white banners uh, when Betsy DeVos was speaking, uh, you know, quietly uh, allowing her to go on with her remarks, but uh, creating this powerful visual. There's a walkout uh, uh, in a, an incident when Michael, Mike Pence was giving a commencement speech and that video sort of ended up going viral because they did it in such an orderly way uh, that, you know, it, it, uh, there was just a certain discipline to it that uh, you know illustrated this powerful sense of conviction. So I, I basically agree with Greg. There are all kinds of creative ways of doing this, and it's it's I think it's extremely important to educate people in those uh, techniques and to explain to them you know why it is when you're engaging, for example, ahead of an objectionable speech. You know what what the options are for students who want to be. Uh, you know, seen and heard, uh, but, but but not crossing that line of silencing someone else. Robert and then Christina and Carlos. Uh, I mean, I'm all in favor of creative protest and creative forms of counter speech, but I just want to register a slight dissenting thought. I kind of squirm at the idea of um, a bunch of grown-ups telling the kids, like, you know, tutoring the kids on how to express their political discontent. Um, I think it's really, I mean, it's just kind of, that's an aesthetic objection as much as anything. Um, I think it's, I think it's important that we don't too quickly fall into the habit of imagining that students who adopt potentially counterproductive methods of protest end up stymieing their own political aims, um, that they're just benighted, that they're just foolish, right? Like sometimes the dysfunctionality that's involved in those counterproductive forms of protest is a symptom of a real deep political disconnect between those constituencies and the communities that they're part of. And I think we need to be a little bit more kind of inclined to, at that moment of dysfunctionality, like be humble and listen rather than say, you idiots, you're doing it the wrong way. Dr. Olsten. Yeah, so I, I've seen students do a lot of different things to show up in creative ways to counter protest throughout my career. Um, you know, a lot of them are around this, this, like social media gives this ability to mobilize really quickly. And so if there's a, uh, an event where it's a pop-up protest, nobody knew it was going to happen. Um, this happened at a previous institution I was at where, um, you know, a, a small organization not affiliated with the university came, was yelling like really hateful things at students, um, really racist, homophobic sexist things of students. And um, so students turned to social media and they ended up, like there was like eight people that were in a protest. And then all of a sudden there was like 600 students around the eight people and they were engaging in a counter protest as well. And so it was just a really powerful visual of how our students can mobilize really quickly to get a message out and to, to stand up to, to engage in counter speech uh, with speech that they do not agree with. So I've, I've seen that happen. I love the uh, donation campaigns that I've seen happen to really direct funds to an event that is um, of interest or passion of our students. You know, I've also seen some really creative ways to, um, you know, I've seen 
angel costumes kind of show up to set, kind of surround Fred Phelps when he brings people to yell. And Fred Phelps has been on almost every single campus I've been on um, and have been able to see the students counter protest in, in creative ways. So the students are, are genius, they're, they're creative, they mobilize quickly and they're able to get their message out there. So uh, there's a ton of different ways for students to engage in counter protest. Dr. Cortez. Yeah, I, I, I get to play the age card now at, at age 87, so I'm gonna play it. <laughs> I was actually picketed by Fred Phelps, Greg, and I was giving a diversity workshop in Topeka, Kansas, and there came Fred Phelps outside picketing me, and I went outside, invited him in to talk to my diversity workshop, and he wouldn't come in. He would rather stay outside, and, 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 and that was that. And I actually took the, the group, the workshop out and walked up to him and handed him and said, here, here is my workshop, say something. And it drew a silence. That's all I can say. And we went back in and continued the workshop. But I wanna throw in one other thing on this of one of the oversold ideas that gets in the way of the conversations, more speech. I believe in more speech. I think it's an oversold idea. More speech on diversity has been happening since the late 60s. Are you gonna tell me in 2021, we have less hate than we had in the 1960s? More speech does not work against hate. More speech helps to build understanding. It can also build more misunderstanding. There's absolutely no evidence that shows the great God more speech is the all-purpose defeater of injustice. And that's why so many people in the diversity, uh, diversity circuits just close their ears when they hear someone coming on about more speech. Now, I say this as a more speech defender and as one who say the diversity movement has benefited from more speech. And I defend this in diversity circles, but the overselling of this idea as being the all-purpose solution, I think undermines free speech arguments. So let me take up this theme. Um, we've got a question here on misinformation and disinformation. Uh, what kind of restrictions are appropriate when considering misinformation and disinformation on campus? Uh, would you consider activism rooted in false information, sometimes intentionally false information protected to the same extent as sincere opinions. And I'm gonna add my own addition, uh, I'm gonna add something to this question. It is misinformation, false information on campus, is this one of those areas where more speech is the best answer or are there steps that can and should be taken to suppress or uh, stop false, intentionally sp false, especially speech from occurring at all. And I guess the answer may be different on public, for public universities than for private universities. Public universities, I'll say as someone who was a First Amendment lawyer, uh, as well as an equality lawyer, are sharply limited in their ability to restrict speech because it is not true. But would appreciate any of your thoughts on how to react to false speech on campus. I'm happy to Go ahead, Susan. Um, we, do, we actually do a lot of work uh, at Penn America on disinformation and you know overwhelmingly disinformation is protected by the First Amendment. You know, you're allowed to lie the, you know the, the parameters of our political speech are very broad ranging. There are all kinds of negative ads that you know uh, skate the edge uh, and, and don't cross over into you know, the narrow categories of uh, speech that is ex accepted from the First Amendment, things like uh, defamation or libel. And so a lot of our emphasis in, in our work is on uh, essentially inoculating people against the threat of disinformation through education and awareness and how to spot disinformation, how to avoid being a vector, how to talk to your friends and family about disinformation. And I think that's a, a useful strategy for universities to consider. I mean, obviously it depends what the disinformation is about and whether it's a subject that you would appropriately and normally be engaging in, uh, you know, on. You know, obviously a, a major uh, 
battleground right now is COVID and health related disinformation. I think that's an area where, you know, the university can be a source of credible information. We've seen some interesting developments on social media over the last year in terms of much more aggressive elevation of credible sources of information. I'm sure people have seen this on Twitter or Facebook. If you search under COVID or hydroxychloroquine, you know, what pops up is the WHO and the CDC, and they really, you know, do a lot to try to suppress uh, harmful disinformation. They've taken some of it down, but some of it stays up if it's not seen as, uh, you know, potential, uh, uh, potentially causing imminent harm. And so, uh, you know, I think that's one sort of model perhaps to look to, but ultimately I think we're not gonna be able to stop disinformation at the source. So these, these sort of defenses, I think you should come out of certainly, you know, ideally elementary school, middle school, high school, but certainly college being very well girded against the threat of disinformation and well informed about how to uh, avoid stepping into it. Other thoughts on m responses to misinformation and disinformation? I'm actually more afraid of the cure for disinformation, uh, to be honest. The, um, I think we're, when people mention disinformation and they have any concept in their head that it's easily fixed, um, I, 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 I just I think they're not thinking about it thoughtfully enough. There's a really influential book that had a lot of effect on the way I think about things. Uh, Martin Gurry's Revolt of the Public, which talks about 2011 Arab Spring explosion of the potential of social media, but it led to a situation in which, with you know, with 50 eyes on on an ind individual issue, um, you know, ideas get stronger, people get refined in their arguments, all this kind of stuff with a hundred million eyes on any institution, person, or idea, um, it's very hard for anything uh, to stand up. So right now we are in an, frankly, historically unparalleled level of sort of like epistemic anarchy. And one of the things, one of the problems we're having is that people don't trust the institutions and sometimes the institutions give them some reason not to. So I think that Suzanne is right that, that under the current circumstance, the only thing we can do is inoculate people, get them ready to spot some of, some of this stuff. Cause you, you're right, you can't get at the source. I do sometimes wonder if something like Twitter though, that had no anonymity where it was tied to your Facebook account where basically you couldn't, you, you knew it was a person, not a bot on the other side of it. And you had to live with what you actually post might be might be better but then again anonymity you know ma makes some sense if you're trying to say controversial stuff so basically if anybody tells you there's an easy solution to misinformation they probably think they know people who know it all and honestly nobody really does let me go to another audience question universities are sites of perpetual learning but the transient nature of student populations sometimes undermines efforts to build competency in first amendment principle every year Thousands, if not tens of thousands of students leave and thousands more arrive. For many, especially um, first generation students, for example, free speech principles may be new to them, non-intuitive. Uh, this can result in a vicious cycle where student expectations about university responses to controversial ideas differ from what some of us at least believe to be required by First Amendment principles and every successive decision by the administration only widens the ideological and emotional gap between the aggrieved student population and the administration. Um, how can, if, if such a cycle exists, how can we de-escalate it? And the, the questioner also thanks you all for your service on this panel. Anybody who wants to take this one on uh, would welcome your responses. I'll, I'll jump in first. So uh, one of my former colleagues uh, from the University of Vermont when I was up there had mentioned um, that, you know, we have a set amount of time to engage with students. And, and, and just what this, uh, the person who asked the question is really getting at, uh, you know, a, typically a four year cycle, maybe a, a two year window where students live in on campus and are engaged in, in that learning environment. Um, and, and that's why we have to keep doing the same things. Like our, we're in a cycle because it's always new students coming in, students leaving. And so really, you know, my colleague had talked about, it's like, it's like a parade, if you will. Like you get students and you have a set amount of time to engage, to teach about a different principles, to sift and winnow, like we say here at Wisconsin. And, and then we launch our students into the world. 
And so uh, this is like the, the challenge that every single campus is navigating and how to create effective programs within a four year structure uh, to, to help create citizens of the world. And, uh, and I think we're doing a lot of things right here at Wisconsin and there's some opportunities for improvement as well. So, uh, but yeah, this is, this is a challenge and we look at it as a cycle and that's why we have very specific first year experience programming and then uh, throughout the years uh, that our students are here at Wisconsin. It's a great question though. Um, let me pose another question from the audience. Dr. Simpson described a conception of free speech based on um, Bentham and Mill. Are there other different philosophical conceptions of free speech that might provide a different lens through which to view the tension, including the tension between free speech and diversity that we've been talking about? The, 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 while you're thinking about that panel, um, the um, the question also asks, uh, if you mentioned the CLE code, would you please repeat it? And the CLE code was civics, C-I-V-I-C-S. I'll just say briefly on the first question, since you've given the code, uh, you know, there are different theories and rationales. I mean, something I talk about quite a lot is, uh, and I, I, again, devote a chapter and dare to speak to this is, you know, why do we protect free speech in the first place and the idea that it is a catalyst for truth, for sorting out fact from falsehood, for innovation, scientific progress, artistic creativity, that all of these things are enabled by an open environment for ideas. But you know, I think a, a, a second sort of insight that uh, has become important for me in trying to understand how to reconcile these competing principles is you know, if you have people who are for any number of reasons shut out of the conversation, who can't get a book contract, who can't start a career in journalism, who can't get an academic appointment uh, it, you know, by virtue of their race, their gender, uh, their socioeconomic status, or uh, any other barrier, that impoverishes this open marketplace for ideas. There are people who are missing, there are perspectives that are lacking or occluded. And so I view the work of defending free speech as encompassing, you know, part and parcel of that is dismantling these barriers and making sure the campus is a place where everybody, uh, you know, can come and be educated and, and feel secure enough to test out their ideas and to, you know, position themselves to go on and pursue their interests and have a career. So I actually see these, these themes and these imperatives as, as, as closely integrated in that way. Uh, and, and meanwhile, I, I have a very different idea of, of the value of free speech, and I, I mentioned it before, but I call it the lab and the looking glass theory, which is grounded in the idea of humanism, that essentially uh, our endeavor is to go about the difficult business of knowing ourselves uh, as we are. And I do think that one thing that, that always stuck with me is my mentor, Harvey Silverglate, said at one point, I want to know who the Nazis are in the room uh, so I know who not to turn my back, back on. And what, what this made me realize is that you're not safer for knowing less about the world in which you live. You're not safer for not knowing what people really think. And when people only talk to people they agree with, they tend to get more, uh, more radicalized in that direction. So my, um, uh, my defense of free speech is, is simple, but it's expansive. It's about, it's about knowing the world as it really is. And if you think you can know um, what, what the world is really like without taking seriously what every person thinks at some level, even out of just pure curiosity, you're, you're not really understanding the academic mission. You're not really understanding the, the project of human knowledge. So I think free speech, you know, is, uh, to a degree, it, it's essential to always know where people are coming from under uh, for both for democracy and for science. Robert. Um, yeah, so the, the question I was particularly interested in whether if we adopt a different understanding of the, uh, the sort of normative foundations of free speech, whether things then look different at the point where we come to think about the relationship between free speech and inclusion and diversity. And I actually think the answer to that question is that whichever kind of normative themes you emphasize when you're talking about the justification of free speech, the, the relationship between 
free speech and inclusion and diversity, I actually think ends up looking similar, right? So the three main themes you get in the, the sort of the history of free speech theory are the, the, the stuff about truth and understanding that I was talking about that's sort of grounded in Mill. Um, there's a theory that emphasizes democratic uh, participation, um, which kind of has its, uh, maybe its most influential defender in the States is Michael John. And then there's a theory that emphasizes individual autonomy. And I actually think under any of those theories, um, you can come up with compelling arguments for saying that there has to be a balance between sort of rigid protections for free speech and certain kinds of selective, moderate um, limitations on speech insofar as if you have a totally unrestricted free speech regime, there is this risk that the capacity of people in marginalized communities to partake of the relevant goods is going to be affected. And this is just very similar to what Suzanne was saying. I think you get those same kinds of concerns coming into view, whether you're emphasizing democratic participation, whether you're emphasizing individual autonomy or whether you're, you're emphasizing truth seeking. Now, there's a, there's a debate to be had under any of those things about how exactly the balance is to be struck, but that there is a balance to be struck and that there's arguments to be made in both directions, I think ends up being the case, whichever kind of theory of free speech you, right. you go for. Let me pick up on, on your comment, Robert. As you know, there are three dominant theories of freedom of speech, certainly in law uh, there are. Um, one is one based on individual liberty or autonomy, but this, this runs into a, a question which may be answerable about why speech as to other freedoms that, that we might think important should be privileged. Second, that it furthers the search for truth. In other words, that if we can all speak more or less freely as opposed to having the government decide what can be said and, and can't be said, that it will help us know what is and isn't true. And third, democracy, that it furthers constitutional self-government. Uh, and again, if, if government is allowed to permit what can be said and what can't be said, it's going to censor speech that is critical of those who happen to be in power at the moment, and you can't run a democracy that way. Um, and I do think it's fair to say that the democracy conception of speech um, is probably predominant, at least in, in constitutional law circles nowadays and, and in many judicial opinions on freedom of speech. But isn't there a problem here? I mean, if, if freedom of speech is about truth and democracy, boy, it doesn't seem to be working very well in 2021 America and probably many other countries as well, uh, does it? Uh, so a provocative question, and this is coming, I might mind you from somebody who believes deeply in these principles. Uh, Dr. Cortez, I see your, your hand up. Yeah, and, and by the way, Dan, you're, you're, what you just said connects with one of the questions that appeared in the chat room about civics education. Uh, it was asked, uh, don't we need more civics education? Uh, and I think we need more free speech education. My response is this, since I have never seen a free speech regime, because I have, I never have, I've never run into place anywhere in the world where there is walk around free speech that is without consequences, without things happening to you that's gonna cause you to, to restrain your speech later without norms, it doesn't exist. Uh, and that in fact, if we're going to go say civics ought to be taught, which it's, I think it's important, uh, freedom of speech ought to be taught in the colleges and universities, which is important. It ought to be taught alongside the system of real world restraints on speech that are incumbent upon us to recognize, if not we're involved in malpractice, we're actually teaching people about a freedom which in a walk around sense doesn't exist, which is gonna get them into trouble if they try to access it. And I just I had said, mentioned that in my paper about students being turned down for admission to college for using their free speech. And Greg has intervened in some of these cases. Professors being taken out of classroom. There, a bill of goods has been sold about free speech because it has not been combined with the real world teaching of restraints on speech, non-governmental restraints on speech. I write a whole section of my book on this. To go back to law and government, the First Amendment takes us away from a real world of speech restraints. All right. And that so is, I think, the new kind of civics for the 21st century that we need. 
We've got just a few minutes left, so I'm going to invite the remainder of the panelists to either address the question I posed or, or if for your closing remarks, uh, keep it to a couple minutes each. Just uh, say anything that you think needs to be said at this stage. We'll go around the horn. Greg, may I go to you next? Unmute. Sorry about that. I always mute when, I, when I'm not talking. Well, uh, so uh, just really simply, um, you know, we uh, have seen a surge in students getting in trouble for what they say. Sometimes I think, you know, sometimes uh, in things that sound like the cases we're talking about that, that have like a, that might be considered hate speech, but mostly not uh, overwhelmingly. And if you're a professor um, or a student who needs help, please contact us at thefire.org. Uh, we're happy to help. We have resources. We have lawyers. Um, and, uh, you know, please ask for help. We, we, wanted to, we want to help defend your rights, and we have a great track record in doing that. That's it. Great. Thanks, Greg. Robert, you next. I guess I'd just say that to the extent that um, democracy and truth are in trouble, it's sort of idiosyncratic to think of uh, any particular stance that one might take on free speech, uh, either as a sort of a, an ethical principle or as a, a principle of law, as being responsible for that, because the kinds of problems that we're seeing for truth and democracy um, generalize across a whole range of different regimes and political cultures, right? Both sort of more libertarian cultures like the United States and, and much more kind of social democratic cultures in Northern Europe and, you know, in, in uh, Asia and Africa and, and, and the Middle East, you know, the, the kinds of problems that we're witnessing are not to do with the civic culture or in much less the civic education practices of any particular nation. It's to do with, you know, the relationship between citizens and their governments and the fact that every government um, is in hock to, you know, <laughs> giant multinational corporate interests. I think that's the, <laughs> I mean, that's that, yeah. So I, I, I just think it's the wrong diagnosis to say any particular stance on free speech is the, the source of the problem there. Christina. Sure, one of the things I just wanted to close with is uh, something that Dr. Cortez said um, was really around, uh, you know, the piece of, with restrained speech. And I'll give you an example, I'll give you a story. So, because uh, we get a lot of people reaching out to us, providing a lot of different examples of things that have happened. We had a, a communication coming again from outside UW Medicine about a student who had posted a picture when they were in middle school um, and with, with a symbol in the background and using this as an opportunity to engage in conversation, to talk about this, but then also to talk about um, that this image is out there, that someone is sending this to us. And, you know, the student is not connected with that symbol in any way, but, you know, the, the impact and implications of this. So we engage in often conversations with students about this. And, you know, when I was in college, if you took a picture, it would, you know, take what a month to get back. It seemed like, and now everything is so readily available that we really engage with our students around what are you putting out there? How are you representing yourselves? And and there are some consequences to that. Typically, social cons. I mean, they're not going to face consequences from the university for their speech, but there will be uh, some of that repercussions that Dr. Cortez had mentioned. So I, we always engage in conversations with our students about that. Suzanne, you get the last word. Oh, well, thank you. Look, I, I think there is a lot that is dysfunctional when we think about the sort of rationales for free speech and the ways in which our current discourse is falling short. And it's, it, it, you know, it's particularly vivid sort of online where we see that falsehoods propagate uh, you know, at, at an exponentially faster pace than truth does. And so I think we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and, you know, I think Carlos is, is right that we have to reconceive free speech. And, I, you know, I talk about this a lot in my book that, uh, you know, goes well beyond the First Amendment. We cannot leave it up to the lawyers uh, and the judges. So many of the threats to free speech that we're talking about today, uh, you know, don't even implicate the First Amendment. And so it's really up to us as citizens to kind of renegotiate and, and, and navigate how we're going to live together you know, in this uh, changing society where we want to become more equal, more inclusive, but we also want to keep robust open discourse. You know, I, you know, I sort of agree speech has never really been entirely free, but there's a big difference between government uh, in, infringements and intrusions and you know, what we 
uh, negotiate and adopt as a society and, and, and taboos and self and, and uh, self restraint. You know, it actually in the Penn Charter, they talk about voluntary restraint as being a critical element uh, of an open landscape for free speech. And that was back in 1948. So I think there are, there's sort of plenty to draw on in terms of how we do this. It's not that hard to imagine, but it's a lot of work and it's not something we're used to really working on in this way. I mean, it's, you know, uh, for, for many, many decades, it was sort of the work of the ACLU uh, and uh, you know other civil liberties organizations, but I think that what's needed now is a much wider societal shift. And so uh, my final plug will be for Pen America. Uh, take a look at the work we're doing in all of these areas, and we'd love to get you involved if you're interested. Thank you. Well, thanks. Great note on which to end. Let me thank again the Thompson Center, our fantastic group of panelists for sharing your perspective and wisdom, and all of you in the audience for participating today. We had a great turnout, and I thank you all for joining. Eric, I think, has a few words on behalf of the Tom Thompson Center with which to conclude. Thank you, Dean Takaji. Uh, I wanted to, to just finish up uh, with a few things. Number one, um, there's one more CLE code to provide and there's a Google form in the chat. So for those who would like to provide the two different uh, words, uh, the one that was previously provided by Dr. Takaji and the other one um, that you can provide now, um, feel free to submit that to Google Forms so that you can get your CLE credits. Um, and uh, we'll move on to a couple parting comments. Um, so I'd like to thank our, our co-sponsor today. We had a student group, the AEI Executive Council today that, that assisted us uh, in, in getting word out on this event. Uh, we appreciate all those that attended. I wanna give a, a personal thank you on behalf of the Thompson Center uh, to, to the audience, but also to all those that participated today, specifically moderator Dean Takaji from the law school, uh, Dean Olstead, Dean of Students at UW-Madison, uh, Suzanne Nossel, Dr. Greg Lukulinoff, uh, Dr. Simpson, and then Dr. Cortez. And I, I'd like to make another note just about uh, one comment provided by Dr. Simpson. I know um, he mentioned, uh, I believe Alexander Meikle, John, is that the right uh, reference that you were making? Yeah, so it's great to hear that uh, a former UW faculty member is, is, uh, is remembered on, on these sorts of topics. There's a, a building on campus for the Integrated Liberal Studies Program and uh, and that is probably displayed outside the building there. So we appreciate that reference and, and his impact on this topic. Um, so to close, we again, thank you. We have an event next week on COVID apps. We encourage you to attend, it's next Friday and you can find it, find it on the events listing. I believe Tio will provide that in the Q and A uh, segment um, that you can find, uh, but you also um, can find it on our website under events. So thank you again for joining us and have a good day.